Welcome to the third series of Understanding Islam. We've called this series Building a Just Society and we're going to be looking through these weeks at those elements of human society which are brought under the guidance of God and therefore we can call them a Muslim way of living socially as human society. We're going to begin by looking at the family as the basic building block of society. One of the most extraordinary things that the Prophet does in the early period in Mecca and Medina is to make marriage the foundation stone of human society. Before his time, we can say that there was nothing really that we would recognize as a permanent marriage commitment within Arab life. But from this time onwards, a man and a woman must formally declare their commitment to one another in the contract of marriage. They must remain faithful to each other. And this then becomes the building block of the whole of society from that time onwards. Marriage becomes the only acceptable place for the expression of our human sexuality. Marriage becomes the place for the raising of children. Families are the extended networks that pass through society, binding human beings together. The Prophet taught that marriage is half of your Muslim way of life. By this he's talking about those twin ethical values of taqwa, God consciousness, and sabr, patience. That human beings learn these two great qualities through the institution of marriage. And he himself sets the example of being married to his wife Khadija for 24 years in an exclusive monogamous relationship and that becomes the foundational pillar of his own life. So marriage is part of his sunnah or his practice. After Khadija has died in the last 13 years of his life, he then contracted multiple marriages. So we can see that throughout his adult life, Marriage is the normal condition of the Prophet. And indeed, he has a hadith, a saying, that says, I fear God more than you fear God. I eat and I fast and I break my fast. I sleep and I marry. What makes you think that you could be more pious than me? So anyone who wants to follow in my tradition, in my path, in my religion, should marry. This then is the relationship at the heart of human society. There is no monasticism in Islam. The single state is not an alternative way of living. Now it sometimes happens in human society that for some reason people don't marry. And according to Islamic teaching, this is tolerated. So it might be that someone is so caught up in their mystical practice or is so totally consumed by their scholarship that they don't marry. That's tolerated. It may also be that people cannot marry because they're too poor, can't afford to keep a wife, can't afford to keep children. Again, in this situation, someone is cautioned that they should control their sexuality and they should do this through fasting and through prayer and to ask God to bless them with sufficient funds that they can keep a family and thus get married. So the single state is not something that is encouraged. Indeed, there is a hadith of the Prophet again that says that the married man who spends the night in sleep 
is more pleasing in the sight of God than the single person who spends the whole night in prayer. Marriage in Islamic understanding is a contract between two individuals. Now like any other contract, it must be freely entered into or else it is not valid. So a forced contract is by definition no contract at all. In the same way, a forced marriage is no marriage at all. And we have an example from the life of the Prophet here to make this very clear. A young woman came to him with two men with, along with her, her father and another man. And she said to the Prophet, O Messenger of God, My father married me to this man without my consent. And the Prophet investigated and asked the father, and the father said, Yes, of course that's true. That's what we always do. That's the tradition of our people. Not in Islam, said the Prophet. Marriage is a free contract between two individuals. Marriage dissolved. The woman then turned around and turned to the Prophet again and said, Messenger of God, please will you now marry me to this man? Because now it was her choice and she freely entered into that contract between herself and her husband. Now, marriage in Islamic understanding, as in many traditional societies, is not just about a man and a woman coming together, but rather it is the coming together of two families. So when a couple marry, the man takes on responsibilities for the wife's extended family, and the woman also has responsibilities to her husband's extended family. So it's very important that both families are able to get along together. So seeking a marriage partner is a family affair in traditional societies. Now, if you think about it, where do people find their marriage partner in a society in which men and women are not freely mixing together? Well, they need to turn to their families and ask their help in seeking a suitable marriage partner. And the families then engage with each other and try to find people who are compatible. Of course, the ultimate decision is to be made by the two people concerned themselves. There can be no force in such a marriage, but the families help to arrange two people who are closely matched together, who have the same sorts of values, the same background, the same culture, and in such a good match, then love will grow between them. We often call this an arranged marriage, and it's found in many religions and cultures around the world. In a society like Britain, in which the traditional bounds of family life are often breaking down, through education, people are moving into professions which were beyond the expectations or the understanding of their parents or grandparents, then often young people are, have to find other ways to seek out their prospective marriage partners. And so families and individuals will turn to marriage bureau. They might be in the press or it could be on the internet, or they will ask their friends to be on the lookout to seek out a good marriage partner for them. And in this situation, it's not unusual that the two young people find each other, and then they introduce their families and get them involved in the process. And sometimes this is called an assisted marriage. When it comes to seeking an appropriate marriage partner, who would be the right person for a Muslim to marry? Well, you can imagine that some people marry on the basis of their clan or their tribe or their race or their ethnic group. Some people marry on the basis of wealth. Some people marry on the basis of beauty. But the Prophet tells his community that my community should marry on the basis of piety. 
This is the most important criterion when looking for a prospective marriage partner. Someone who is a faithful Muslim, who is observant and practicing, who is seeking to grow in piety and wisdom and therefore closeness to God. Now, who should a marriage partner be in terms of religion? Well, this is not as simple as it sounds. For a Sunni Muslim man, he may marry a Muslim, a Jew, or a Christian, but not somebody from another religion or an atheist. A Sunni Muslim woman must marry a Muslim man. The Shia scholars interpret this rather differently, and they say that a Muslim man or woman should marry another Muslim. There are some Shia scholars who will allow that a Shia Muslim man might marry a Jew or a Christian, but even in this case they caution against it. It's quite common for Sunni men to marry Shia women and vice versa in those parts of the world in which both communities are living side by side. Well, we might ask, why is this distinction between men and women according to God's teaching in the Quran? And the scholars have pointed out that traditionally, when a woman married, she moved into the family home of her husband. Now, if a Muslim is moving into a Christian family home or a Jewish family home, how much chance would she have of continuing in the practice of her religion. What about her children? How would she be able to bring them up as Muslims? Whereas we can see that a Christian woman marrying into a Muslim family home, the whole way of life of that family home would support Islam. Now such a Christian or Jewish woman is allowed to continue in the practice of her faith but the family supplies the Muslim context, the ambiance for the children to be brought up as Muslims. Even in those cases when a Sunni man is marrying a Christian or a Jewish woman, often all parties feel, well, it would be better if she converted, because then there would be a common front before the children. There would also be uh, a, a sense of living together in one harmonious family. Now, we mustn't imagine that this is the principal reason for female conversion to Islam in a country like Britain, for example, because many women convert to Islam before marriage is on the agenda. As in many cultures around the world, marriage is something which has all sorts of cultural traditions. But the actual Islamic part of the marriage is really quite straightforward. The first thing is that a marriage contract has to be drawn up between the man and the woman. Now, they can agree to put into this contract anything that they like, as long as they both agree on it, provided that it is within the acceptable bounds of Islamic law. This contract will also include a marriage gift, mahar, from the man to the woman. This can be a sum of money or it can be some other service. And this is her right from that time onwards even if later on the marriage ends in divorce, in most circumstances, she keeps the marriage gift. Now, once this marriage contract has been drawn up and agreed, then the ceremony itself, the nikah, the contract of marriage, consists of signing this contract in front of two witnesses. And this is normally accompanied by readings from the Quran, a talk about the importance of marriage within Muslim family life and practice, and also prayers to ask God's blessing upon the couple and upon their future life together. From this time onwards, the man is responsible for keeping the family 
and for looking after all the expenses of the family. The woman is responsible for preserving the honour of the family and respecting her husband. Both of them, of course, are to be faithful in marriage. This is an exclusive bond. And they are to be modest, not to make themselves sexually attractive to other people other than their marriage partner. The vast majority of Muslims in the world today are monogamous and go through life married to one partner alone. But Islam does permit limited polygamy, provided that the man can treat all his wives equally. And then the Quran goes on to say, if only you knew how difficult this was, then one is better for you. Now, this is interpreted by the scholars as being a preference for monogamy, but permission for limited polygamy. These verses of the Quran were actually revealed after a battle, and in the battle lots of men were killed, and so there were widows and orphans who needed protection. So one of the circumstances that would make polygamy a desirable option, according to Muslim scholars, is when there are war widows and other widows who need a new family in order to give them status and protection within society. Just in the same way, if the first wife is unable to have children, then to bring in a second wife and she will have children for the whole family or it may be in the course of a woman who has been divorced and needs a new family so that she can have a place within society and within a structure. To leave lots of women in society after war, for example, unable to find a partner would be regarded by Muslim scholars as being an injustice, something unfair. They should be allowed to enter into marriage, to have a family, and to have that fulfilment within their lives. Now the Prophet himself, in the last 13 years of his life, entered into polygamous marriages, with divorced women, with widows, and in one case with a woman who had never been married before. And there are several elements of his practice that help us to understand this business of treating all the wives fairly. So for example, he always gave them the same marriage gift, no matter what was their social status. Each one had her own home, and the prophet used to go by rotation for a night and a day to spend that time with each of his wives. When he was going travelling, then he would draw lots to see which of his wives would accompany him. And in this way we see that he is setting an example for treating one's wives fairly when polygamy is regarded as a desirable option. Now in addition to nikah and to polygamous marriage, there's also a third form of marriage that we see in some Muslim societies. This is called muta or fixed-term marriage. Now this is based on a verse of the Quran, but Sunni and Shia scholars differ as to who forbade it. The Sunni scholars say that it was forbidden by the Prophet and therefore it's not permissible, whereas Shia scholars say it was forbidden after the time of the Prophet and therefore it is still permissible because it was practiced during his time. Now, a fixed-term marriage means that the two parties agree to marry for a set term, and that time can be determined by both of them. It is a marriage in which the children of that marriage are legitimate, and they inherit from both parties. And at the end of that marriage, a woman must observe the traditional three months waiting period to see whether or not she's pregnant 
because obviously if she's pregnant, it's from her mutter husband, and he becomes responsible for keeping that child after the end of that marriage. A marriage gift is paid from the man to the woman for this mutter agreement too. Now, in traditional societies, mutter was often used by students who weren't yet able to enter into a full-time marriage and by men who were travelling to work, as we would say today, on short-term contracts away from home. And it was a way of preventing them entering into illicit sexual practices so that they would have um, a God-given way for the outlet of their sexual urges. Today, in modern society in which people need time to get to know one another, it is not unusual within Shia society to find that couples will make mutta together for a short-term period in order that they can get to know each other, and they can agree to put certain limitations on their intimacy during that mutta period. Now, unfortunately, all of us know that marriages don't always work out, and sometimes difficulties arise. So within Islamic custom and practice, the couple are then urged to try to sort out their problems between themselves, to talk it through if possible, and if that isn't sufficient, then they should call in the extended families on both sides, and there should be a kind of arbitration or counselling service provided by the two families. And if that doesn't work, and it's impossible for the marriage to continue, then the final option is divorce. According to Islamic law, a Muslim man can divorce his wife by simply declaring, I divorce you. And he does this in front of witnesses according to the Shia tradition, although in the Sunni tradition he is allowed to do it in private. Now, this then is followed by a three months period during which they are to try to reconcile and to repair the marriage if at all possible. If they come together again as man and wife in this situation, then that washes out the divorce. If after three months they still cannot be reconciled and still want to go through with the divorce, then it becomes final. The three months period, of course, enables us to see if the wife is pregnant and therefore who is the father of her child. After the divorce becomes final, both parties can remarry and this is encouraged. A woman who wants to initiate divorce proceedings can go to the Sharia court and the Sharia court, as it were, hears and defends her case even against her husband. So if her husband is absent, he doesn't come before the courts, even if he is unwilling for there to be a divorce, then there can be a decision by the Sharia court to free her from that marriage. There is a third form of divorce, which is there within the Quran. And that is in the case when a man suspects his wife of adultery, and he can swear an oath, I accuse you of adultery. And he repeats this four times over, I accuse you of adultery. And then on the fifth time, he takes an oath, if I am lying, may God punish me, I accuse you of adultery. Now the woman can counter swear, and she can swear four times, I'm not guilty, this is not true. And then on the fifth time, she also takes an oath before God, calling God's punishment down upon her if she is telling a lie. Now you have got a situation in which both have mutually sworn and invoked the curse of God. This marriage is then ended, 
and it is now up to God to deal with them on the day of judgment. In societies in which the civil law of the land has been written according to Muslim teaching, then the civil courts will handle divorce law as well. In a society in which civil law is not based on Islamic law, then if the couple are married according to the law of the land, then they must have a civil divorce according to the law of the land. They will also need to have an Islamic divorce. If they are married only according to Islamic law, but they have never registered that marriage according to civil law, then an Islamic divorce will end that marriage because the state never recognized that they were married in the first place. The custody of children after divorce is something on which all schools of, of law have given guidance, and that guidance varies between one school and another. The general principle is that the child should remain with its mother as long as it is dependent upon her. Obviously, that's while she's breastfeeding, but most schools of law will see that going on for some years after as the child is growing up with the proviso that she is a fit person to raise that child. After that period, when the child has now grown into young adulthood, then a final decision will be made, and at that stage, the feelings and the opinions of the child will also be taken into consideration. If you have missed any episodes of this Understanding Islam course, then you can catch up with the whole of the first two series, that's 24 programs, by going to the Ahlalbeit website and to the On Demand section and then look for Understanding Islam. And just to remind you that there is an article that goes with every one of these programs and that can be downloaded directly from my own website. Join me next week when we'll be looking at the Islamic ethics of life. I look forward to seeing you then.